given uh, one of the wonderful checklists that's on their website. And for anyone that has a family member who is going to be downsizing, the website is just terrific and gives you lots of ideas on how to face having, you know, decades worth of um, personal possessions and just trying to face those, uh, those challenges of downsizing. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, Ralph before we jump into it. And um, so Ralph Galati is known to many, many people in Delaware County. He's really one of ours. Um, he had a military career that began when he went to the United States Air Force flight training in 1970. And when he finished his uh, military career, he um, wrapped up as a captain in 1978. After um, he had his uh, finished his active duty. He did continue to serve in the reserve until 1981. He has a master's degree in public administration and human resources from Golden Gate University. And after his military career, he was hired at IBM and remained there for, I believe, 28 years and um, worked as a certified client executive and global account manager in the industrial sector. That sounds really important. Um, and he developed all kinds of solutions for large global enterprises and had numerous leadership and sales awards. He also worked for SAP and worked in education and training. Um, after his, uh, his primary uh, career, he also was the founder and former director of the Office of Veteran Services at St. Joseph University, which was his alma mater where he developed and implemented a small business and entrepreneurship training program. But I think for me, the moment that I became aware of Ralph was when he had a very um, important, but as compared with these other positions, probably one of the less significant positions, which was when he was serving in his capacity as the veterans liaison for Delaware County between 2011 and 2013. And what happened is that as I was reading the newspaper and as I was looking in the town talk and as I was seeing things in the area of veterans, I kept seeing Ralph's name everywhere. And I mean everywhere, on bulletin boards, in press releases, in advertisements, and I thought to myself, this guy is, is everywhere. And really, like, who is this guy that knows everything about veterans? And so I reached out to, to Ralph, and I got him on the phone, and I basically said, who are you? <laughs> because it was as if a light had come on in Delaware County in the area of veteran services. And it truly was. It was as if there was a bright source of knowledge and warmth. And that truly is how I've experienced Ralph from 2011 to today. And so for me, I know that all of us that know Ralph experience him all in the same way. So for us to be able to have Ralph to ourselves for a whole hour is really a privilege. And so for us to be able to sort of talk to him and really get into the weeds, about some of his most personal experiences is just a real honor. And I'm so really glad to be able to have this chance. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit more to Ralph. So Ralph, if I say is one of ours, he went um, to high school in Delaware County. He's known to um, many of us as somebody that we have tip our hat to on Memorial Day, on Veterans Day, on POW Day. We see him in parades um, with the convertibles and he's waving to us because we know him to be a POW. And I thought it was important as we all experience um, for many of us living through a pandemic is one of the few times that we will have during our lifetimes to have an experience of such intense collective stress where we feel a vulnerability like no other time. 
that's unrelenting. And so for me, um, this is an opportunity for us to hear from somebody that's been there before in a very personal way. And I was so grateful to Ralph that said, I don't care what you ask me, I'm happy to talk about it. And so rather than just sort of say, thank you for your service and gloss over what I think is really um, interesting, we're gonna take a few minutes and just let Ralph tell us a story that I think sort of, you know, we know about, but we don't really hear the details. And I'm really grateful that Ralph is, is allowing us to sort of to go behind the curtain. So when I introduced Ralph and I talked about the fact that he was um, in the US Air Force, um, the story begins that he was actually in Vietnam. And when he was in Vietnam, his role was as a first lieutenant. So at the time of the deepest part of the story that we're going to talk about, he wasn't yet a captain. He was a first lieutenant and a strike team leader that was deep inside hostile territory. So if you're looking at the slide, this is a really very blurry slide. But if you look at it, this is South Vietnam and then North Vietnam. And if I had a laser pointer and if I could use this, I would just point out to you but there is a long stretch where if you look at the waterline, South Vietnam and North Vietnam uh, don't necessarily connect. So if we had Ralph, if you want to comment on this, Ralph, when you're actually in hostile territory, how did you actually get into hostile territory? Well, actually, I was, uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. I was actually in the southeast corner of Thailand, a place called Uban, and um, because of where we were located, all of my missions at the time were over Laos and Cambodia. And then there were comparable American bases in South Vietnam throughout, from Saigon all the way up to the north, uh, that flew a lot of the missions in South Vietnam. And then you could see the red line there that separates South from the North, and that's the demilitarized zone. So, um, so we were, you know, depending on where you were, you could have air to ground missions or you could have air to air missions. Out in the sea, there were naval uh, vessels that had uh, aircraft carriers that were flying missions as well. Um, and, and we were flying missions throughout North Vietnam up until 1968 when they, President Johnson called the ceasefire. And they didn't heat up again until my missions in 1972. So the other thing in balance is uh, there's a big difference between the air war and the ground war. And I have to, I have to really uh, give my hats off to the, the Army and the Marines that were slogging it out there in the junk in South Vietnam and the jungles and the, and the swamps down there that was really difficult. And, you know, fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat or eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball is a lot different than, you know, flying in relative safety from Thailand at 25,000 feet. So. Uh, very different situations depending on what unit you were in and what location you were in. But for your story, you're, you're credited with being in hostile territory for over um, two hours of actually being, I guess, shot at right. while you're marking um, targets for other uh, members of the Air Force to be able to um, place uh, you're placing the targets so that those targets could be destroyed. Right. Yeah. So on February 16th of 72, we were flying as what was called a forward air controller, which is uh, two guys and a crew. And we were flying just above that red line there, just in the, just in the southernmost area of North Vietnam. And our job there was what was happening was the North Vietnamese, along with the Chinese, were firing missiles and rockets over the DMZ into into uh, American held bases in South Vietnam. So even though we had a ceasefire, we were still what was called a protective reaction strike. We were really just firing back on those that were firing at us. So we were flying a mission as a forward air control, which is find targets of opportunity, whether they be missile sites, rocket sites, gun sites, tanks, uh, petroleum areas, whatever you could find, it was a target mark it and then uh, call in the bombers and then go out and find more targets. And that was our job for a couple of hours. We were flying there uh, every half hour or so or 
40 minutes, we have to go out to uh, get refueled either out over the water or over Laos and come back and do it again. And so we were there for about two and a half hours before uh, all hell broke loose. And so all hell breaks loose because you get shot. All hell breaks loose because um, uh, all of a sudden the uh, surface air missiles or the SAM missile radar sites started to activate. And we saw those indications in our cockpit. So now our job became one of finding those surface air missile sites and taking them out so that they didn't bring down American aircraft. And that's what we were trying to do. Uh, you know, a couple, a couple uh, came at us and we eluded them, uh, but one came up undetected from below and behind and, uh, and hit us kind of in our six o'clock. And we heard a big thump and uh, it usually doesn't have to hit you directly. It really is more of a, excuse me, a proximity. So we were hit with fragmentation from the exploding missile. And, uh, and at that point, you know, when your engines go out and you have fire lights everywhere and you have no flight controls and you're losing altitude, uh, you don't have many options. And we were flying really low because that's the job of a forward air controller. So we didn't have enough altitude or airspeed to make it to the ocean or even to Laos. So we just kind of cinched up and be prepared and we, we did our mayday call and then we, uh, we did a very controlled ejection the problem was our ejection was over North Vietnam. So it was literally in hostile territory. So you're immediately captured and then becomes your 406 days as a POW. Right, so we, uh, unfortunately for us, we were, uh, we were flying during the Tet holiday, which is their big uh, Lunar New Year. And the, so, so that was uh, not too uh, celebratory for the people on the ground and then we, uh, we ended up uh, ejecting in the area that we were bombing and then the plane crashed in a village where we were bombing and then we flew down in our parachutes uh, in the same village. So uh, the good news was the aircraft didn't explode and kill us. Uh, the good news was uh, our ejection seat and parachute worked successfully, so that didn't kill us. Uh, but the problem was we landed right in a village and they were waiting for us because the aircraft had just exploded there. And the bad news was this was the village you had been bombing. Well, nearby, yeah. And yeah. So they so we looked down and uh, we didn't have a chance to evade because as opposed to South Vietnam, which was mostly jungle, uh, this area, North Vietnam, was, was uh, farmland. So we really didn't have any place to hide. Uh, and we landed in the village and the villagers uh, were waiting for us. We had no chance to escape. We were just hoping to survive. And, uh, you know, they beat us up pretty good. They probably would have killed us had it not been for a local, we think it was just a local militia guy who probably had enough orders or savvy that said, if I could get these aliens to uh, uh, Hanoi, I could probably get a promotion or a reward. So him pulling us to safety probably saved our lives that day. Mm. And then 24 hours later, we made our way up. We didn't know it at the time, but we made our way up to uh, Hanoi and that's where the games began. So for 406 days, do you actually, um, do you experience 406 days as 406 days or does it seem basically just sort of one long? No, the, uh, we, the important thing, we kept track of the days pretty well. It was harder when you're in solitary confinement, but uh, so the first, the first week was more of isolation, which is really difficult because uh, you know, you're food deprived, sleep deprived, you're being punished and you're being beat up and you're being interrogated. Uh, and the days and nights kind of run together a little bit. And, uh, you know, you really have nothing but a, but a dank cell to live in. And, and, and you're, just trying to, you're just trying to survive. And, uh, and I had a head injury because they, they uh, uh, the town people there kind of took uh, pretty good advantage of us there with rifles and gun butts and, and so I had a head injury and, and, you know, that wasn't treated. So, you know, when you're, when you have your wits about you, it's one thing, when you don't have your wits about you, plus you're sleep deprived and food deprived, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, resist. So, you know, our new, our new um, mantra now was the code of conduct. And one of them was, you know, you give name, rank, serial number, date of birth. And that's what we tried to do during the interrogations. And so that lasted about a week. Uh, and then I got 
basically an upgrade from isolation to merely solitary confinement. And that lasted you know, for 65 more days. So for a total of 75 days, I was in uh, solitary. And, and that's kind of, it's kind of where we are now. Uh, I didn't realize that would be my training for COVID, but that's really where we are. And uh, surviving in that environment is not something you train well for. Um, but what you find out about yourself is you find out really all your strengths, limited as they might be in my case, but also uh, the things that surface are all of your weaknesses. And so if you, if you understand your strengths and you leverage them as best you can, and then really understand your weaknesses and try to overcome them, uh, that's a real interesting challenge. So with COVID and where a lot of folks are right now, it's a lot of it is, you know, how do we, how do we survive this uh, self isolation or quarantine and being stuck in your house and wearing masks and, uh, you know, not being able to socialize. Uh, I can sympathize with that. Yeah. I, could also, I could also say, you know, kind of get over it. You know, no more woe is me. You know, everybody has to do it. You're not alone. Uh, but you really find out what you're good at and, and, uh, and where your strengths are. But you also find out that, you know, there's some things I'm pretty lame at. And it's, it's, time, to, it's time to fight those battles. So what's interesting about this is that on February 15th, 1972, did you think of yourself as a particularly courageous person? No. Nah. <laughs> you know, I I, on, a, on a good day, I was probably a lame ass. On a good day. So, and, and how old were you? 23. 23 years old. Yeah, and I'd only been in Vietnam like 90 days. And uh, I was flying on my 69th mission. And, and the objective there was, you know, just keep busy, learn as much as you can. And, uh, you know, do your, do your job, come, you know, survive, come back keep training, you know, keep upgrading yourself, go out and find another mission the next day and, and just kind of get over your tour, uh, which at those, years, those times was, uh, was one year. Uh, but you, know, you don't think of yourself, uh, you know, it's really, it's a job uh, and it's one of just survival. You know, your objective was not to be shot at and hit, you know, it's do your job and come back and, you know, live to fight another day. And, you know, right. there's nothing special about it. Well, and I think, you know, when, when we talked about, um, you know, this, this discussion and how, um, how this experience really relates to what we're experiencing now, what you said to me that really resonated was that you are so much stronger than you think you are, like we all are really. And that if, you know, the idea of nobody really thinks of themselves as courageous until they're put into the position of having to go through an experience like we're all going through yeah, yeah. and really to see that we are stronger than we realize. Yeah, and, and we are, you know, similar to where I was, and I, I don't want to make this a, a, a total comparison, but when you're put to the test, which is what we are right now, and I was in 72, that's what you find, they find out what you're made of. <laughs> to be simple about it. Um, and, and it's, you, you could either collapse under the weight of the circumstance or you could be resilient. And I know that's the topic for today is resiliency. And, and I, I do firmly believe most people are stronger than they give themselves credit for. You just don't realize it until you're put to the test. And, and you can see it in coworkers, you can see it in family members and, and any place else that you socialize, you know, if you're into sports. You could see that people that kind of cave in at the first sign of, of, uh, of a challenge and others that thrive when they meet the challenge. I mean, they just can't wait for the next challenge to hit them. Uh, so, but until you're put into a life or death situation, which I, I don't really consider today to be all that life-threatening, although if you do something really stupid, you can be. But when you're, when you're in a life and death situation where they can kill you any day and nobody would be the wiser, that's that's pretty tough. So you really have to be sharp. You have to be on your A game all the time. You have to be adaptable. Uh, you have to be able to recover quickly from these life-threatening, uh, traumatic circumstances that occur every day in combat and, and in uh, captivity. Uh, and if you let it debilitate you, if you let them see you sweat on any given day, then they have the upper hand. 
And you not only have to be able to fight and resist that day, you have to have enough resolve and strength uh, to be able to recover so that you could do it again the next day. And that's really hard because uh, uh, sometimes you don't have the physical or mental or emotional strength from day to day because you're not being fed properly and you might be ill and, and you might be suffering from guilt because you didn't think you did a good enough job on any given day. So fighting all those battles is tough. And, uh, but just like guys in South Vietnam, you know, your Marines and your army guys that were fighting every day, watching buddies be killed, and this is happening in, in the Gulf Wars, um, you know, you could have your roommate or buddy be killed, and guess what? Tomorrow you gotta go back out and fight again. So that, that takes a whole different type of resiliency. And, and I think a lot of it is today is people suffering from, you know, COVID boredom or, or whatever term you wanna associate with it. And somehow you have to fight your way through it and be sure that you're not just doing something selfish or stupid that will cause harm to you or somebody else. So. Uh, this, this is really an interesting time for people to find out what they're really made of. Well, and I, so what I'm hearing is, yeah, we are stronger than we think of. And I also think your point about the isolation and for many of us, this can be some of the, we are, many of us are experiencing um, isolation for the, talk about that in a few minutes, a little bit deeper. Um, so obviously, 23 years old, six days, prisoner of war. Um, the idea is, is that that life experience and your service um, within the Air Force really resulted in many, um, many awards and recognitions. And I know that I'm embarrassing you, but we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> and I wanted to um, just spend one minute because I thought it was interesting. I didn't know anything about these um, I'm putting this in the PowerPoint and I'll be happy to share with everybody. But I think everybody knows what a Purple Heart is, which is if someone's injured or killed. But I wanted to just take 30 seconds and just understand a little bit more about the Oak Leaf Clusters and these other um, medals that you got because, you know, first of all, were these all awarded because of the one experience that related to you know, that horrible day or the prisoner of war experience, or did these all come through all of the military service? So could you just tell us a little bit about um, all of your recognitions and, and how um, these all relate to your service? You know, the, uh, the Silver Star was actually for the mission on the 16th. So we got that, you know, after we got back. Um, I think it was probably a little overdone, but, but it, it tended to meet the criteria of uh, Silver Star, which which is like the third highest um, combat related uh, medal. So there's the, uh, and, and in perspective, let me, everything is about perspective and balance. Uh, the top award for heroism obviously is the Medal of Honor, which uh, you know, is given really, really very rarely. Uh, after that, it's a big drop off to everything else as it should be. But the Silver Star is, is a combat related to the gallantry award. Uh, the Bronze Star is kind of a, a level or two down from that. It's, it's, it's similar, uh, but, but less significant. Uh, oak leaf clusters are just meant to show uh, God. So if you have one oak leaf cluster, it means you got the base award. And then you got a, if you got the award a second time, like the Purple Heart, you would get an oak leaf cluster. So you wouldn't wear two of them, you just wear the oak leaf cluster. Um, some of them, like the Air Medal, uh, you have multiple oak leaf clusters. Sometimes that is now uh, every 10 missions in combat, you would get an oak leaf cluster. So that, that's why you get multiples. Some are combat related, some were related to time in POW, some were related after my time, you know, just for other awards in the military. Um, yeah. They're significant when you're on a four miles into a Starbucks, they'd still charge me 10 bucks for a coffee. Okay, so there's nothing miraculous about any of them. Uh, I am in awe of Medal of Honor. Uh, I actually, um, I, I have to, uh, if I'm at a speech, I, uh, I have to make sure I warn people that 
please do not use the word hero, uh, especially not with me. Um, I see two people. They are Medal of Honor recipients and those that die in combat. And everybody else is a, is a way, way distant second. Mm -hmm. So I talk about my time in uh, Hanoi, whether it be in solitary or, or regular confinement, as neither heroic nor brave. It was just survival. It was just following the code of conduct and doing the best I could to resist. Uh, fostering communications, which is a big issue, like right now, hopefully we'll cover that in a little bit. Uh, but basically doing your duty. It's just my duty on February 16th and later was different than my duty on February 15th. So. Well, and, and I can appreciate why you don't want to be called a hero, but I also don't want you to, um, and I know you're so humble, but for me, when I actually looked at being a lawyer, I kind of overdid it and I did research the Silver Star. And I do think that it's not like you just happen to squeak in to the category of the silver star. I mean, I really believe well, it, was, it was a good mission. I mean, it I was a that very was good mission. And yeah. Well, it's over my shoulder here. You can see it there. It's back. Excellent. Okay. Well, and, and I now, uh, you know, and I really do think it's important you know, we, for those of us that don't serve in the military, for those of us that don't know what a, um, clusters, it should mean something. Yeah. And I, yeah. even though we take just a few minutes of our time today, I just think it's important for us to understand um, that it's not necessarily within our realm of experience, but, you know, obviously we've learned something here that, um, you know, obviously there is a distinction between the Medal of Honor and that calling somebody a hero means something if uh, they've given their life. So I think just having a different perspective that you've shared with us, that's okay. really important. All right. Um, and, and thank you. Sure. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, things that everybody can relate to, the idea that we're in the middle of this pandemic. And I say we're in the middle, but we're not really in the middle. And if we were in the middle, we would be saying we're on a countdown to 100, another 49 days and then it would be over. But what's interesting about that perspective is even if we were in the middle and all we had to do is go through another 149 days, it's still fewer days than the number of days that you were in, uh, you know, in confinement and that you were actually a POW. So, which is kind of interesting. You know, I feel like I have um, many times sort of felt like, wow, this can't go on much longer, only to have felt really smacked down after I uh, started looking at this presentation and saying, wow, I must really be pretty weak if I can't even, um, you know, avoid complaining after 148 days. So, if nothing else, preparing for the presentation has given me some very good perspective and I'm no longer complaining. I think the other thing that's important to recognize is that this uh, presentation is coming at a very important time because your, uh, your context and your point of view is I think going to be helpful because the second wave is no longer theoretical. The second wave of the virus is now upon us. And to just reflect about what the first part of the virus was like, and to think about, um, you know, when you use the word trauma and what it was like for, you know, having that experience in February when you were shot down and having the jarring experience and what that was like to be in isolation. It, it wasn't so long ago that we had that jarring experience. And I think for our law firm and for our clients, um, you know, I, I just wrote some notes about how, you know, at the time when Governor Wolf um, in March 19th, that was when um, the, uh, you know, the Pennsylvania actually ordered the statewide closure with all non-life sustaining businesses to be closed. And there was a real question, you know, what does that mean for our law? 
And so we actually felt we were essential. So we sort of all packed up our uh, laptops and our scanners and our phones and, and just took to our own home offices and kept on doing business. But what occurred after that was extremely scary for our clients. Um, there was one family that lost not only a mother, but a father within one month to COVID. There was one day where we lost six clients to COVID. They all passed in one day. There was uh, one family that had an aunt that due to the isolation and her dementia passed away because of the broken heart. And our state administration paralegal has from this COVID had pretty much a one third increase in our state administrations. Um, our families have been traumatized. Our clients have uh, been reeling. This has not been an insignificant um, event that is lightening up at all. The second wave has not um, been something that has felt like, um, you know, has, has been something we're waiting for. For our families, many of them have not been able to visit loved ones that are in facilities. So this has continued to be a very scary time a very, very scary time. And for many families um, that have had interruptions of their jobs and their work and their income, um, it's been very scary as well. There are people that are caregivers at home for not only um, elders, but children. And, you know, it's very scary in terms of, you know, how do they manage that plus continue to work. So I, I really um, feel like part of the, the public service or the message that we're, we're hoping to bring today is the perspective and the wisdom that you have so that we can um, really remind people that they are stronger, as you said, but also to sort of give them some more words of wisdom. Um, so that when you think about um, the messages and the things that we want to talk about, I want to sort of ask you to draw upon some of the other life experiences that you had that really relate to the education that you've done. And in the area of um, the veterans work, you've actually, I think, done some important work for the, um, at St. Joe's, you developed the entrepreneurial program. You've also, I think, counseled a lot of um, looking for homeless vets. I just know that you're like a natural educator. And so I'm, I'm wondering when you, as somebody that has had that incredible life experience at age 23, an incredible career, and now living this incredible experience with the rest of us, what is it that you want to say to everybody to sort of help us prepare for the second wave? Um, I, I am like everybody else. I am really angry and I'm very frustrated. Okay. I am, uh, you know, I, I don't like the fact that I can't go out that often and uh, I have to wear a mask to see my granddaughter and, uh, you know, she wants to be hugged and you can't hug anybody. I mean, I want her in school and her parents don't want her in school. I mean, it's, it's, these are challenging times. Um, but at the same time, it's, we don't have the opportunity to get complacent. So it, you just look at the numbers and you'll see that, you know, the numbers are creeping back up again and it's, especially right now with an election coming up, it is politically dynamite for somebody to shut down anything again, even though that might be the smartest thing to do. But uh, so, you know, frustration and impatience are one thing, but we just can't let our guard down. And, and these all come back to kind of my POW time. Um, I wanted to focus on a couple of things. One of them is, uh, um, we still on okay? Oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, I'm just backing up a little bit. Okay. Go ahead. Um, that's not necessarily any specific order, but if I can offer you something, I would, I remember when I went to conferences when I was with IBM and some of them lasted several days. Um, and, and my objective was if I could get one nugget per half day, <laughs> just one little actionable nugget every half day that I was there, then I figured that was okay. I could do that. So what I ask a lot of your folks maybe is, is come up with something to do every half day, have a little plan and, and then 
not just have a plan, but it's like business. You have to execute the plan. So having a plan is great. Acting on the plan is even more important. So some things you could do uh, that are important. One of them is, and I'm, I'm giving this once again, balance and perspective. There's only so many times you can sort and rearrange your sock drawer. Okay, I'm not talking about that. Okay, that's just busy work. Uh, but you can actually do some things that could help yourself and some other people. So when's the last time you actually called somebody, like on a phone, uh, or wrote them a letter, something other than text or email? Uh, in POW camp, whether I was in isolation or solitary or had roommates, communication was the lifeblood of our organization. Uh, keeping everybody else informed about what was going on was essential because we still tried to run POW camp like a military unit. And we did. We had senior ranking officers. We had guys in charge of rooms. I mean, if you were in a room of two people, whoever was senior was in charge. So we tried to run it with the same structure that we were comfortable with. And communications was pivotal to know what everybody else was doing, what we should do, what we should not do, make sure we're not interfering with somebody else's plan, really vital. So uh, there's people that are suffering today because they're lonely uh, and you might be lonely. So one of my actions would be, uh, add this to your list is communicate with somebody, write them or call them and it will do you good and it will do somebody else good. Uh, having a strategy for post-COVID, uh, if you are a business person, that's one thing, especially if you're a small business owner. Linda mentioned uh, entrepreneurship. Um, that's really important. Uh, but having a plan, building a plan and being re realistic about this plan, but also making it such that you could adapt or act or react depending on circumstances. So I think, Linda, you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, post-COVID or six months from now is not going to be, whatever that normal is, it's not the normal that we're familiar with. But the, we don't know what the new normal is going to be. Uh, so if you have an action plan or you're building a plan, uh, I would suggest to you have one that has alternatives and use now a time to strategize about what do I do if this happens? What am I able to do if this happens? Or is my plan for later doable? Is my plan that I'm thinking about today uh, executable six months from now. And that's something you could spend some time on. I know Linda will be glad to hear this if you don't have, um, this is not a negativist statement, but if you haven't done your wills and powers of attorney, that's an action you could do. Start to think about what you want to do to plan for your future. Uh, if you haven't done any volunteering, think about volunteerism. Uh, if you're retired, it's something you could do. I spent some time with the USO. I've done some things with veterans. Uh, whatever you do, they should be meaningful and productive, not just busy work. You could find plenty of busy work around the house, but find something substantial to do that you will feel good about, but also you'll be helping somebody else. Uh, outreach is important, uh, whether it's your neighbors or your friends or your family members, that's also critical because it's part of your communications plan. Uh, some things as simple as exercise, whether you wanna do physical exercise or yoga or Tai Chi or something else, uh, anything you could do to keep yourself, your mind and body refreshed and activated and distracted uh, will probably be good for you. Um, in some cases, it's really good just to take a breath uh, and realize that in balance and perspective, uh, where we are is not life-threatening, especially if you're in your house. Uh, to me, from a balanced perspective, you know, every day is a good day because I'm not being shot at. Uh, so compared to where I was, most days are very tolerable. I could still be upset and frustrated every day, but compared to where I was, things are really pretty good right now. Um, so you got to really prepare yourself, not just for what you know, but the unknowns, regardless of circumstances. Um, there was an old story about a guy with a positive mental attitude. I, I can't remember what movie that was from. Uh, might have been the original MASH, I can't remember, but uh, it's really hard to keep that in times of high frustration. Um, but communications is important, uh, uh, always. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think what else I could say. Um, somebody asked me to get on a different topic slightly for a second. One person asked me in a speech one time if I could take my entire PW experience and formulate it into one word. What would it be? 
and I, I had to think about it for a while, and I said, developmental. Hmm. And, and I meant that really sincerely, and it still holds true today. Um, it's the first 75 days in solitary, I learned a lot about myself. And then when I got moved in with other roommates, at one time it got up to about 30, uh, I was the youngest usually, and I was the juniorist. So everybody outranked me. And the nice thing about it was I had military officers that were all aviators, but they were from the Air Force, uh, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. So I had, I had 30 mentors that mm -hmm. I would have never otherwise had. Uh, and so granted, we were in the same circumstance, but communications was vital. And, and I learned a lot about things that I would have never otherwise learned about until much later in life. So um, for those of you in business, especially, if you don't have a mentor, uh, find a mentor. There's plenty of great organizations that do it for free. Or be a mentor. And that's something you can do from a volunteerism standpoint. But, but that time for me was extremely developmental. And it's a little bit frustrating to think about that now, but it, it is something that uh, could be important to you as you, if you could use this time somewhat positively. Um, I think I, I talked about before, now's not the time to be selfish or stupid. Uh, now's not the time to think that things are over. Uh, but it's also not the time to just get so frustrated that you, that you uh, throw your hands up and say, oh, I've been through this for 150 days. I don't think I could do it for another 150 days. Trust me, you can do it. Uh, I didn't think I would do it. There were guys that talked about it. If they, if they knew that they were going to be there, and, and I was there 14 months, uh, perspective. Uh, Everett Alvarez was there eight and a half years, okay? So when I thought my time was bad, I just remember Everett Alphabet or John McCain for six years or other guys in between. Uh, so in all things, it's about perspective. And so, yeah, we, we, we don't like where we are for 150 days and it might last another 150 or another 350. Uh, trust me, you're strong enough that you could do it. It's just, you have to be prepared and take some of these action items and some opportunities uh, and don't just let every day be another boring day. You know, you, there are some things you're, that are in your control um, that you could do. And just remember that your actions have consequences. And uh, it's important that um, you realize that if you, if you want to be selfish and go out without a mask, as an example, realize that there are consequences to that, to yourself or people that surround you. So. Um, that's a couple of things. A lot of it is just about preparation and knowing that you're probably more resilient than you give yourself credit for. If you look back 150 days and realize where you are and where you are today, uh, if you're dead, you're not on this call, but, but realize that we somehow survived. You know, we're, still, we're still okay. You might not feel great. It's not the best situation you're in, but you're okay, uh, which means you could probably continue to do a little bit more. So. Well, and I think what you're saying is that if you're talking about words like preparation, you're expecting yourself to move forward during this so that you're not actually um, allowing yourself to be frozen mm -hmm. and paralyzed by the fear. So in other words, you're, you're just forcing yourself, if you are frozen, to just recognize that reaction and just step out of it. And do something make a little bit of a plan and if it is a matter of um taking small steps to what it seems like what you're saying is even the smallest steps mm -hmm. um help you do something that creates emotion and if the isolation is um beginning then reaching out is actually going to be pulling you out of your being frozen yeah. in a positive way if that's the very first step yeah and you're not unique i mean every we are all in this together and when i talk more to a business audience i always tell them when in doubt act never do nothing and right. and the point there was even as a junior guy you know the guys my my mentors would tell me hey look you went through college you went through flight school, went through training programs, survival schools. You know, you've had a year and a half of education before you flew your first mission. Um, we, we know you're okay. You, you just don't have a lot of self-confidence yet. Uh, so uh, if you have to make a decision, the odds are, given all that training, maybe not a lot of experience, but given all that training, you're probably going to make a pretty good decision. The odds are is it'll be okay. might not be perfect. 
uh, but it'll be okay. And if it's not okay, guess what? When we do a debrief, we'll fix it. But if you do nothing, <laughs> you have no chance of success. <laughs> right. So you know, give yourself some credit, take action, you know, and, uh, and you're probably, you'll be better off for it. Yeah. Well, and I think that no matter um, who's listening, I think what you've said, there's something for everybody in what you've said. And I think hopefully people that are listening, it'll resonate with them and they'll get what they need because you've covered so much in just that small amount of time. So I want to go over and just make a few more points because I know we're, um, we're going to run out of time. Um, and I wanted to just, let's do this one. How do I get to that slide? Um, okay, I'm going to talk about resources first, then we'll, we'll do one more thing. So in terms of the, um, the elder law content, um, the pandemic has sort of um, resulted in a few things sort of being very different. And again, when we send out the emails, I'm going to share the PowerPoint with everybody as well. And the coronavirus tax relief, this, these are hyperlinks so that when you um, think about um, the, the deadlines that have been extended for tax returns, you can go to this um, slide and on this hyperlink, you'll be able to go directly to the internal revenue um, sections that relate to that. For those of you that are over 70 and a half or actually 72 now that the SECURE Act was passed, there was um, uh, a nice provision that said you do, do not have to take your required minimum distributions, your RMDs for this year because of the pandemic. And that's summarized in the IRS notice 202051. And for some of you that might have actually taken the RMDs and have questions, this is a great notice because it'll give you some um, information about the ability to return those funds. Again, it's a hyperlink. For those of you that are um, frontline workers, and again, the statistics show that for Pennsylvania, the rate of infection last Saturday had the same number basically as what we had in early April. And as I understand it, perhaps we know enough now that we won't have the same fatality rate because of the ability to treat people and manage their, um, their illnesses. And so hopefully we won't have the fatalities that we had, but we do seem to be having um, the second wave in a very strong impacted way. And so my heart goes out to all of the emergency responders in the front lay, uh, line. And uh, there is a hyperlink on tips to take care of yourself. And again, um, you know, for the firm, we do have a standing offer for anyone who is a frontline worker. And that is a very broad category. We offer um, a complimentary health care power of attorney slash advanced directive. So if you, there's any way that we can support you with that, we'll be happy to do that. Um, there is a veterans crisis line that I put here um, as just, I know that uh, Ralph would want to have that there no matter what. It's unrelated to the um, pandemic specifically, but again, I wanted to put that there. There's important COVID guidance that I am including as well as CMS, which is the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services um, that goes county by county. So if you want to actually see how the second wave progresses, you can go to that hyperlink. And then for elders um, that are 65 or older, Medicare open enrollment is actually um, still important. And this is one of the things that even though it's a pandemic, life goes on. And so I encourage everybody who's a Medicare enrollee to please make sure that you look, if you're in traditional Medicare, double check your uh, Part D, your drug benefit. You might have to reshop your uh, Part D uh, provider for your drug benefit. And if you're a Medicare Advantage, you want to make sure you know what your um, what coverages you're going to have. So a lot of these elder law resources, these are the hyperlinks that will go out. Um, with the last few minutes. I don't know if there are any questions. Were there any put in the chat? Okay. And I just wanted to say to Marlene, thank you so much for joining us as a sponsor. And I didn't know if you had any questions that you wanted to ask Ralph before um, I just have some final comments. Anything you wanted to say? 
Linda, thank you for the opportunity to, to participate. And Ralph, as we discussed earlier, I, I was just so inspired by the message of hope and resilience that I heard you convey at another Zoom meeting. And thank you for sharing a lot of your insight and your experience to help us put things in the proper perspective as I think you've done today and help us to know that we are stronger than we may seem and, and that this too at some point will, will come to, to an end. And thank you for your service to our country. And we do have one question, and, we're, and because it's just one, we're going to ask that that um, attendee can ask it directly. So, um, it, Barbara, would you like to ask a question? I did. Hi, Ralph. Hi. Um, Ralph, I, um, my, one of our dear friends is a Vietnam fellow who has a Purple Heart, but has spent um, many, many years now helping others get the purple heart they were supposed to get because he had never gotten his and he was through Agent Orange and he got it. I thought you might know him. His name is Gene Lang in New York. He's, he's, he does an awful lot of work up there for the uh, Vietnam vet. So I just right. thought maybe he was somebody you would know. Uh, um, no, I don't. And, um, but I'm, yeah. but I'm glad he's doing that. And uh, yeah. for anybody that's listening, if, um, if you need a task, I'll give you a task. One of them is, is uh, everybody should know a veteran. If, if it may be a family member or a neighbor or somebody in your church uh, or a civic group you're with or soccer team, uh, you could thank them for their service, but ask them if they're getting their veterans benefits. Uh, most, of, most veterans today are not getting benefits. Most veterans don't know of their benefits, especially the younger folks, the post 9-11 type folks. Um, and encourage them to do it. Many of them just feel like they don't deserve it because they uh, they figured they, they're not injured enough or damaged enough or qualified enough or they're suffering from guilt or whatever. Uh, you could be doing a great favor to a veteran or a family member by encouraging them to get their benefits. And if you don't know what to do or you don't know where to point them, uh, Linda will give them my name and number and we'll get them to the right, we'll get them to help. And, and that's a public service we could all do. And Ralph, we and our company, we do an awful lot with the VA. So anybody can contact me too. Awesome. And, and I can help them with um, the different, you know, the different benefits and direct you in the, in the right direction. But I just wanted to say you're very inspiring. And um, I know for us, we have had friends that are, we don't even know them anymore. Um, they have just, um, I, I don't want to use the word going over the edge, but they're um, they're just not handling this um, at all. You know what I mean? And it's really scary because you feel like they do need therapy, and you know they're they're not listening. So, but I try to tell them what you just said. You know, we've we've gone through a lot of bad times in life if we're old enough, and so this is to me. I look at this as okay. It, it is bad, but it's a blip in the road and one that we just have to. You know, it's like a speed bump. We just have to slowly get over it and then move on. <laughs> you know, <Yep. laughs> because there's nothing else you can do, and Pretty you have to keep right. busy, like you said. You have to just keep busy and don't watch the news. <laughs> yeah, that helps. <laughs> but thank you think, so much. I think that I think the idea of this being a speed bump it's a very large speed bump. I like your comment. <laughs> thank you for your well, question. Well, um, you, I, what are you going to do? Thank you, I, Linda, too. Oh, you're welcome. I want to just um, do one more thing. Is it showing? I want to, okay. Oh, wait a minute. I want to, can you just put this on? Hold on. I just want to do one thing. Um, oh, you really want to do I do. Wait a minute. I need my Jackie to fix this. <laughs> I can see you back there, Jackie. She's so good. I'm so <laughs> not technology. All right. You want me to do it again? Oh, okay. This one? This one. All right. So we're going to go do the entire, there we go. Okay, Ralph. So I wanted to just say a big, big, big thank you to Ralph. And uh, I said to him, I wanted to make a donation in his honor. And he said, no. 
And Ralph is so humble and I really uh, wanted to do something anyway. And I wanted to just um, point out that every single email I've ever gotten from Ralph ends with um, stand on the shoulders of giants. And I, I really, I just, for me, uh, wanted to make sure that the donation reflected somehow the fact that I always look for that in the email and that it's very meaningful to me. So as a small token and as a small thank you to Ralph, what um, the firm did was actually buy a brick that's a 12 by 12 brick. Oh, nice. And what we're going to do is it's actually a brick for the Delaware County Veterans Memorial. And it's going to be inscribed with the name Ralph Galati, and it's going to say a giant. <laughs> and I encourage everybody that when they feel afraid that they can go stand on the shoulders of Ralph because he is our giant. And I think that when you listen to his story and when you listen to his perspective and his guidance, and when you hear him tell you that we are really stronger than we know we are, and that we really can get through this and not to be paralyzed um, and not to be frustrated, he's got a lot of credibility. And that to take that advice and start, you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. So I wanted to thank Ralph in a very specific way, and but also encourage everybody to do exactly what he's asking of us. And to know that in, you know, as, um, as we were just told by that wonderful questioner, you know, this is a speed bump. We're all gonna be fine. And, uh, and to just thank everybody for coming, but thank you so much for Ralph for sharing his uh, time with us today. Thank you all. And thanks very much for putting this together. And thank, you for the, thank you for the gift. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you so much. And everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Thanks. And also, Linda, thanks for hosting.